Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit of God, we do ask this morning that you would fall fresh on this place in a new and powerful way. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the ways you've moved in the past, in the lives you've changed, the hearts you've touched. We praise you for that, Lord, and we ask today that uh, today something special would happen, that today you would do a new thing, that today you would open our eyes, that you'd open our hearts. We worship you, we praise you, we rely on you for everything. And today we ask that you would take the Spirit of God and the preaching of the Word of God and that you would change hearts in this place. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Have you ever noticed that children have a hard time keeping their eyes closed during prayer? And so do some adults. The reason I know that is because sometimes I look around during prayer. Today, of course, we get in trouble for that, don't we? We're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to close your eyes. Today, it's okay. I want to talk about praying with one eye open. Have you seen those TV evangelists? They get right there in the camera, and they'll pray with their eyes open. And it's kind of mesmerizing. It kind of spooks me out. I don't like it. Of course, they're usually trying to get your money and all that kind of stuff, too. Sometimes, not all of them. Today, we discuss prayer. And if you turn in the book... Uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark. I like to pray uh, in strange places. I like to pray when I'm driving. Sometimes I'll be praying so passionately that um, I'll close my eyes. And uh, I'm reminded, if you're going to pray while you're driving, at least keep one eye open, preferably two. I think the message of Mark chapter 14, verse 38, is that we must stay prayerfully alert in order to gain victory. Kind of like that soldier on night watch. He has to stay alert. He needs to be on the ball. Kind of like that fireman in the firehouse. Yes, they're going to do some physical training. They're going to eat dinner. They're going to maybe watch some movies. They're going to hang out. But at at any moment, that bell could go off. They've got to be on alert 24-7. We must stay prayerfully alert in order to gain victory. And as we move towards, in just a few minutes, doing uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, let's look at these verses that Jesus gave at his last supper in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse number 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But afterward, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even if all be made to stumble, yet I will not be. Peter um, was, was just confident that he could stand. Even when everybody else fall, he was strong enough. He was man enough. He was committed enough. He was going to stand no matter what. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Peter, that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now, Jesus wasn't making that happen. He wasn't ordaining that to happen. Jesus is God. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how weak Peter was, and he knew that Peter was going to fail. Then he predicts it. But he spoke more, Peter spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. All of them. No, we're not going to deny you. You can count on us. Peter takes a lot of flack. All of them ran. All of them hid. All of them, when the pressure came, when the, when the temptation came, when the hard time came, when the soldiers showed up, they all disappeared. Verse 32. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pl- pray. Sit here a while and pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. So the other disciples stayed back. He took Peter, James, and John, his inner circle disciples, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but you will. But what you will. Isn't it interesting that even Jesus didn't get everything he requested? 
Jesus, God in human flesh, prayed to the Father, and it wasn't the, the Father had a different plan. He prayed according to God's will. Most people want to get their will done in heaven. They're not all that interested in having God's will accomplished on earth. When we look at the subject of prayer, even Jesus prayed, according to your will, Father, let it be done. Not what I will, but what you will. Verse 37, then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? That was considered the bare minimum. Just an hour? Don't raise your hand. I wonder how many of us spent an hour this week, just one straight hour in our quiet time. I'm sure some of us did, our spiritual giants. Most of us probably didn't. Could you not just spend one hour Could you not watch one hour? And then verse 38, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray lest you enter temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. Let me ask this question. What if somebody had been on the alert? And this isn't meant as criticism of anybody or any group of people or the military or anything like that. But what if somebody had been more alert? on December 7th, 1941? What if somebody had been out there on an island or in a boat or take, keeping an eye and, and, and maybe a an, uh, hundred miles out could say, we're under attack and could, given, could have given word ahead. Imagine the difference an hour would have made at Pearl Harbor. There probably wouldn't have been. We probably would not even think the vernacular of Pearl Harbor probably wouldn't even be in our vocabulary. What if someone had been more on the alert on October 12th the year 2000, when that boat approached the USS Cole? What if, someone had, what if someone had been more alert? What if something had been done? 17 sailors wouldn't have lost their lives. And of course, the ultimate example, what if on 9-11, two, 2001, what if somebody had been more alert? What if some, could something have been done? I don't know. What if, you know what? We are on alert now, though, aren't we? We have those different levels of alert. Our country's on alert. We're ready, or we're trying to be ready. As Christians, are you on alert? Should we be on alert? Of course we should be on alert. What's happening in this passage? And verse 38 is the only verse we really have time to dig into this morning. Who is Jesus talking to? He he started off at the Lord's Supper with all of his disciples. He moved to the garden with the the nine, took three. He's talking to Peter, James, and John, his inner circle disciples. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is fervently praying. And they are sleeping, even though he told them to pray. Why are they there? Well, they're there because Jesus wanted some time alone with his Father. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, needed time alone with his Father. And he knew how bad they needed it. And he said, please, watch and pray. Spend some time with the Father. You're going to need it. See, he knew what was coming. They didn't. They probably thought it would just be another night. They had no idea what was coming their way. God did. And he recommended, go spend some time. With the Father. But what did they choose to do? They they fell asleep. What did Jesus request? Well, in verse 38, he says, watch. Watch. Literally, this means to keep awake or stay vigilant. Wake up. Pay attention. Be alert. And who's he saying this to? James, John, and Peter. Of course, Peter didn't get it. Peter was snoozing. But you know, eventually he got it because the Holy Spirit used Peter to write these words. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We forget that sometimes, don't we? Don't we forget? We forget that we have an enemy. We forget that someone's out to get us. In fact, it sounds kind of paranoid for me to say it that way. Someone's out to get us. He is. He hates your guts. He wants to ruin you. He wants to ruin your family. Dad, be sure of it. He wants to ruin your family. Mom, write it down. You need to be on the alert. You have an enemy. You have an adversary that wants to destroy you. We as the church, we as a society need to wake up. We need to watch and pray. So we are praying with one eye open. We are accepting the fact that we do have an enemy. That we must stay prayerfully alert In order to gain victory. Victory over who? Victory over Satan and his forces. Victory over the the forces in our media, the forces in our society that want to corrupt you, want to corrupt your family, want to destroy your children, want to make your life miserable, want to bring you down. We need to watch and pray. We need to pray with one eye open. Pray. This is to supplicate, to worship, to make prayers to God. Intercession. Praise. Worship. 
We need to pray. Remember the old hymn? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and shame to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We have a friend, a sovereign friend. He loves us. He wants to communicate with us. We need to watch and pray. The conquest of temptation can only come through these two actions. Watching and praying. I wonder if you've ever heard that little acrostic, ACTS, A-C-T-S. You should write it down if not. A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication. I hope you're a quick writer. This is something you can do in your quiet time this week. Imagine, imagine if some of us made a commitment to spending one hour with God just this week. To, take eight, to, to, to make a vow, sometime this week, I'm going to turn off the, the, the television, I'm going to turn off the computer, I'm going to get alone with God for an hour. Imagine how it would affect your life and your family. Imagine how it would affect this church, spending time in adoration. And if you remember this little cross, you can use it while you're praying. Oh God, I worship you, I love you, I, I praise you, you're awesome. Adoration, confession, keeping short accounts of sin with God. We need to do that, don't we? Always reapplying 1 John 1, 9 because we mess up daily, don't we? Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for my family. Thank you, good Lord, for my good health. Thank you, Lord, even for my bad health. Thank you for my car. Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my house. Do you realize how long you could go just thanking Jesus for all the ways He's blessed your life? And believe me, when you're done, you just feel great because you're no longer, longer concentrating on the two things that aren't going your way. In supplication, oh God, please supply Oh God, I need your provision in my life. I cannot make it on my own. I am not strong enough. I am not smart enough. I am not good enough. I need you to supply into my life what I need. A-C-T-S. Praying. Martin Luther said, I have so much to do. The reformer, Martin Luther. I have so much to do that each day I must start with three hours of prayer. Can you imagine spending three hours in prayer, pray with one eye open. Watch and pray. Listen to these words from, from, the, from the psalmist, my hero David, who says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let none who wait on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Do you need protection? Do you need provision? Do you need God to watch over your kids because you can't watch over them all the time? Do you need God to take care of you? Do you need God to provide for you? We all do. To protect, to bless, to heal, to prosper. Watch and pray. Keep an eye out for Satan's attack. For perversion, it's all around us. For immorality, for injustice, for prejudice, immorality, backbiters, gossip, wolves in sheep's clothing, those who are more concerned about their agenda than God's agenda, and those who flat out, outright hate God. They hate God. And they hate you because you love God. They hate God's Word. They hate everything you stand for. You look like an intolerant, hateful fundamentalist to them. A crazy person. We need to keep our eye out for these things. Are you on the lookout this morning, Christian? Are you on the alert? Are you watching? Did you know that 500,000 people have already died from AIDS in America? Now the problem across the world in Africa is far, far worse. 500,000 people have already died since it really became big in the 80s. And of course, millions are infected. Did you know that the North American Mission Board estimates three out of every four North Americans are lost? Are you looking out for that? Are you looking for opportunities to make an impact? Thank God for Annie Armstrong. And I hope you gave sacrificially today. If not, I hope you'll give sacrificially next week. We're only about a third of the way to reaching our $9,000 goal. We should be able to hit that $9,000 goal without any problem. We're going to have to give sacrificially to make that happen because we realize three out of every four North Americans are lost. So it's worth giving. It's worth making a sacrifice. Are you watching for opportunities to make an impact, either financially or with a word or with a handed out invitation? Something, some effort. Are you alert to the attacks? 
that are the, the, the onslaught. So many Christians are just sort of in their house, just sort of hanging out, think everything's fine. Is that really the case? I don't think so. The attacks are coming our way from those who would like to revise our history and redefine our laws. Think about that. They want to revise our history and they want to redefine our laws to make any perversion, immorality, disgusting thing completely legal. To legalize every bad, sick thing that can destroy our society. We're under attack from the pro-abortion community. We're under attack from the pro-homosexuality crowd. From the Darwinian evolution community. We're under attack from the politically correct crowd. The anti-moral absolutes crowd. That's a mouthful. They have an agenda though, don't they? And they have their disciples. Their disciples are much more committed than most of, of Christ's disciples in America. They are much more dedicated. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're in every institution. They're in the church. Can you believe that? They're in the church. There's churches that believe all that junk. And of course, they're in the, the, the government. They're in the, the, the university system. They're in the judiciary. They're in the school board. And sadly, even in some churches. We need to be on the alert and we need to pray that God will turn things around. We need to pray with one eye open. We need to be attentive to what's going on. And we need to be on our knees begging God to turn things around in our country. And I just want to offer a few, a few visuals here. And, and after church, feel free to pick one of these up. If you want to get on, on the alert, you want to have a better chance of knowing what's going on in your, in your community, I would recommend you subscribe to World Magazine. World Magazine helps people stay abreast of what's going on in our world. You may want to subscribe, subscribe to the Baptist Banner. These are just examples of publications that are intended to help Christians stay abreast of what's going on. Plugged In Magazine from the people over at Focused on the Family to help parents of teenagers understand what's going on in youth culture. Because do you really want to read and watch every filthy thing out there to keep up to date with what's going on? I don't. Have you heard of the Da Vinci Code? You know that 30 million copies of that book have been sold? Folks were under attack. I've not read the Da Vinci Code. I'm in the process of reading four or five other books right now. I can't read, take the time to read the Da Vinci Code. I don't know a lot about it, but I do know that the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, his death, resurrection, all of that is completely, completely blown to bits in that book. It's a fictional book. Dan Brown claims, it's a, it, of course, it's a fiction. It's a story. People read it and they take it seriously. Are you prepared to, uh, to, to do anything about that? We've ordered some books that we'll have in our library and have available to you that will help you uh, with, with the Da Vinci Codes coming out. Of course, we all know the movie's coming out. Are you going to stay up to, to speed on what's going on in society, or do we hide? Do we stick our head in the sand and think, everything's fine, I'm okay, you're okay? SBC Life, a wonderful publication. The SBCV Proclaimer, which is in our foyer, available to you each and every month. We've got to get on the ball. We've got to wake up. We've got to pay attention. It says, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. You see, the, ad the adversary seeks for opportunities when you're weak. None of us are strong enough to fight temptation on, us, on our own. And none of us are exempt from temptation, are we? Every one of us are tempted. And our only defense is to watch and pray. Watch and pray. Why? Because the spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. The spirit, in the case of a person, it could be defined as the rational soul, the psyche, who you really are. The spirit is ready. The King James says it's willing. The, the, the old King James Version says the spirit is willing. It's the willingness to do right. And I don't doubt that we all possess some form of a willingness to do right. We have good intentions for the most part. We desire good things, certainly for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for our community. At the spirit level, we're strong. When the part of man that is spirit is under God's control, it strives against human weakness. But our flesh is still there, isn't it? That's the body. That's, that's the symbol of what's ex external, human nature. The spirit is ready, the spirit is willing, but our flesh, our bodies, the human nature with all its frailties and passions is indeed weak. We're not as strong as we uh, think we are, are we? None of us are. We're not that powerful on our own. Our own strength, we're too weak to overcome temptation. Do you realize that God, and this might come as a stunning statement, God allows temptation to come your way that you can't handle. Now that might sound like a direct violation of uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13. But hear me. 
God allows temptation to come your way that you just can't handle on your own. In God's sovereign plan, He has allowed, and God doesn't bring temptation, but He allows it for things to come our way that will flatten us. We flat out cannot handle it on our own. There's only one way we can handle it, and that's through the strength of Christ. He will make a way of escape. But we've got to be looking to Him. We've got to stop, pay attention, and pray. The Spirit. The Spirit. A reference to the human spirit. Might be willing to do what is right in the spirit realm. But the human body is weak. Peter, James, and John in this story, they were exhausted. They were physically spent. They were worn out. And make no mistake about it, that is when Satan will attack you most. When you're physically worn out. You've been up too late. You haven't been eating right. You're worn out. Satan will attack you. He will attack you when you're weak. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. These individuals were right for temptation. And we know the story. We know they fell. They failed. And we look at our own lives. When we don't watch and pray, what do we do? We fail. We fail. See, it's not a matter of making a new commitment today. I won't do that again. And I'm going to try to do this. And I'm going to make a New Year's resolution never to do that again. It's not going to work. There's no replacement. Yes, you're saved in an instant. But there's no replacement for spending time with the Lord day by day, week by week, growing stronger. John MacArthur says it this way, Because willing spirits are still attached to unredeemed flesh, believers are not always able to practice the righteousness that they desire to do. We all remember Romans 7, 15, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. This is the Apostle Paul, not just a Christian, an apostle. The man who God used to write most of the New Testament. He says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do or that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I don't want to do, that I practice. Can't we all relate to that? To, to, to not want to do the wrong thing, but we do the wrong thing. What's the answer? There is no magic formula. There is no three-step formula. It is getting on our faces before God. Being attentive to what's going on in the world around us and in our hearts. In prayer. Lots in lots of prayer and conclusion as we move to a time of brief invitation and we are going to partake of this Lord's Supper in just a minute. Folks, the church needs to wake up. We need to be on the alert. We fight each other. We fight pitily things. We get bent out of shape over insignificant things. And meanwhile, we have a world that's lost and going to hell. We need to wake up. Number one, we need to wake up and be on the alert. Number two, we need to spend much, much more time on our knees. We need to spend far more time on our knees. When I have a problem, the first thing I do is reach for my cell phone. And I've been convicted so many times. Don't reach in your pocket. Get on your knees. Don't seek some person's advice. Seek my advice. We need to spend more time on our knees, praying for, about our relationship with Christ. Praying about our relationship with God. Do you understand if you're here this morning and you have not repented of your sins, you've, you, you have not come to the place where you've admitted you're a sinner in need of, of salvation, do you realize the only prayer God's going to hear from you is a prayer of repentance? A prayer for apologizing for the way you have slapped Him in the face with your sin. That's the only prayer He's going to hear. He wants to save your soul. He loves you so much. But your sin separates you from, from God. The only prayer He's going to hear from you is a prayer of salvation. A prayer of crying out, giving your heart to Christ. There may be one here that needs to do that today. You need to, you need to pray and invite Christ into your life. Repent of your sins. We need to spend much more time praying for the well-being of our loved ones. Do you realize God can do the miraculous? Do you realize God can do that? I've seen God do the miraculous this week, in the last few weeks. I've seen a relationship of someone I love that was, was just going to, to just falling apart and God restore it. Do you realize God can do that for you? God can restore your marriage. God can, God can, can take things that seem broken and devastated and, and all used up in, in a lost cause and God can mend it. God can fix it. Are we willing to get on our knees and beg Him to do it? Are we willing to quit trying our ideas and just go in Him and beg Him? You may, you may have problems in your family with your kids, only God can solve. Are you praying for your children? When was the last time you spent an hour praying for your son or for your daughter? We need to be praying for the health of our church. In a time like this, we definitely need to be praying for the health of our church. Um, how on earth 
are we going to reach 700 people on Easter morning? I would say it's impossible. I would say in human terms, it, it is highly unlikely that that would ever happen. But you know what? God can do anything. We can fit 700 people in that thing over there. That's why we're doing it over there. We might be a little uncomfortable. The acoustics might be a little not, not the best yet. We're working on that. But you know what? We can, re we can fit 700 people in there. It's only going to happen if we, start, if, if we start praying for our church. If we, get at, if we watch. Look in your neighborhood. Look at your work. Who are you going to hand one of these things to? We have hundreds and hundreds of them. We're not going to run out. And if we do, we'll get more of them. That's the only way we're going to reach seven. It would be miraculous. But God can do the miraculous. God can use us to accomplish His purposes. We need to be praying for the advancement of the kingdom in North America and all over the world. That's why we give generously to these offerings, especially these special offerings. We should be praying for the protection and the blessing of our nation. And the question really is, are you praying? Are you alert? Are you ready? As we, as we move to our time of invitation now and we, and we get ready for this Lord's table, is there not a more appropriate time to just bow before the Lord and do business with God? Not just to watch out here, but to watch in here. Would you pray with me? Jesus said, watch and pray. Pray with one eye open. We must be prayerfully alert if we're going to attain victory in our marriage, in our homes, in our family, in this church, in this community. How's it going to happen? It's going to happen because God gives it to us. How's your prayer life this morning, Christian? How's your prayer life? Today's not about recommitting to having a better prayer life, although I'd, I'd hope you would. And if you want to come and use our altar and, 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 and give some things to the Lord in prayer, it's certainly open for that this morning. Today's more about us just taking time right now to think about what's going on in the world and to think about what's going on in our families, to think about what's going on in our own heart, to watch and pray. Don't let this moment pass you by, whether you're seated in your pew or if you're praying at the altar. Right now, why don't we do business with God as a church? Let's dig deep. Let's look deep within. And as we have our time of invitation, in just a minute our deacons are going to come forward. But if you're here today and you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll pray with you. One of our church leaders would love to pray with you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ personally, you've not had your sins forgiven, you're concerned enough about your own soul, come forward and give your heart to Christ. Have your sins forgiven. I can't do that for you, but I can show you from the Bible how you can have it done. How you can have a relationship with Christ where He will heal your, hear your prayers. Sometimes you feel like your prayer is just bouncing off the ceiling. It may be because you don't know Christ and your sins have not been forgiven. You don't have access to God. But this morning you'd like to get it. Or, or maybe sometime this week you've given your heart to Christ and you'd like to come forward and make a public profession. Or you'd like to come and request baptism. Whatever God's doing in your heart this morning, let this be a time of contemplation, of introspection. We'll have our singers sing to us. You don't need to sing this morning. This wonderful song that prepares us to think about the blood of Christ. Would you stand as we sing this song? The nails in your hands. Come as God leads. Love me.